if they don't do something by July, I think it will be very hard for them to do anything. I think they will will sit tight, probably in terms of the election. Hello, everyone. Carol Roth, investment banker, financial television commentator, entrepreneur, and two-time New York Times best-selling author, discuss the state of the economy, the Federal Reserve, the impact of deficit spending, and the challenges faced by small businesses. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. I want to start where I always start, and that is to get the big picture you know, more of the macro update, your assessment of the economy. And Carol, as you know, we could take all the time you need on this show to set the table when it comes to the picture as it relates to the economy. What does that look like for you today? Well, anybody who's watching the video feed of this will see that I've got very big 80s hair and sort of like a distressed jacket. And this is my throwback to the early 70s, um, kind of late or, or late 70s, early 80s, because, you know, this stagflationary 70s, 80s kind of economy is making a resurgence. So I thought I would just dress up for the occasion. Uh, one of the things that has frustrated me as I've been doing commentary for the last, you know, several years is this idea that we would have all of this intervention in the economy and there would be no repercussions, that there would be, you know, nothing on the other side of that. We would just be able to manage around that. And I think that we're finally starting to see cracks in the story and kind of explain um, you know, what has been misinterpreted. I think over the last year you know, or the, the 15 years that we had, you know, ZERP or close to ZERP in the last couple of years, uh, early on, one of the things that was sort of misstated was the idea that even though we had this highly interventionist Fed, that there was no inflation. And I've argued for a long time, I argued it two books ago and before that, that that wasn't the case, that we had massive inflation, but that inflation was in assets and it was in the stock market, it was in homes. And so the people who had assets and, and benefited from that kind of loved it and didn't really view it that way. And it wasn't until some of the recent policy, some of the direct stimulus to consumers and, and some of the other decisions where we saw that inflation migrate just from the asset side to sort of everyday cost of living. And then it's like, oh, look, we have this inflation, which you know I would contend has been going on for, for a long time. So I think that's one thing that we have to kind of look at. The other thing is this idea that we've had this amazing economy. And I really feel like the economy has been very much window dressed and we're starting to see a, a little crack in that window dressing. They're starting to run out of decorations, so to speak, Julia. And if you look back at just, let's say, last year, last fiscal year, the government ran deficits to GDP that were depending on you know what you count the deficit. I say it was two trillion because there was an accounting um, little trickery that was going on there, but they really spent two trillion dollars. So deficits to GDP were like seven plus percent, and that is you know double the historic average. And when you think about going back in history, if you have expansion, that should be reducing the deficit, right? You're collecting more money that's able to, to pay down the deficits and, and, or, and cover some of the spending. But what they've done is the opposite. They tried to use deficit spending to show that we had this incredible quote unquote economy. And that was incredibly expensive not just in terms of the dollars of the deficit, but now they have to finance it at the highest rates that we've seen in you know, 15, 17 years. So now that we've got some data points coming out here in 2024, Q1, that 1.6% was almost a full percentage point less than the street expected. We had the April uh, jobs report that you know was not as robust as expected. I think we're starting to see diminishing returns on all of that excess spending. And I think that really can shine a light for the people who haven't glommed onto this already, that there really hasn't been this amazing economy. It has been a, a deficit-driven economy, very expensive, and we are paying the price for that quite literally 
today and will continue to do so in the future. Yeah, that was going to be my follow on question is if the, the growth has been all driven by the deficit spending, at some point, we're going to have to pay for that. And also makes you wonder like, that's it's not, it's really not sustainable either. No, I mean, the word sustainable is one that has come up, um, actually, the, the opposite of it, non-sustainable a lot. And you've had pretty much every entity and, you know, high profile person that exists saying that the fiscal situation of, of the United States isn't sustainable. It's the IMF. It's the CBO. It's the Treasury. It's the Fed. It's Jamie Dimon. It's the seem to lab. You know, like anyone and everyone has has said. You know, you'd have to be kind of crazy to, to say no. I think this is entirely sustainable, and we're seeing um, even just the interest on the debt. You know, the last estimate that I've seen that is if we don't do anything to interest rates and we don't do anything to change sort of the the spending that we're on track for $1.7 trillion in interest expense over the next 12 months, which puts it potentially as the biggest line item on the federal budget. And so what does that say about a country whose biggest expense is interest on their debt? That is not a healthy situation. That is not a sustainable situation. And so the challenge is there's this giant elephant in the room. We all see it. And nobody is like, hey, maybe we should get the elephant out of the room. And that's the challenge is that we don't have the political will and we don't have enough pressure from individuals, you know, that people are, are freaking out about a lot of things and there are plenty of things to freak out about. But like, when's the last time we saw a march in the streets, you know, on the Fed or on the fiscal situation or about the debt? Like never. So until that becomes an issue that politicians say we, we can't find a way around anymore. And I, I don't think anything's going to be done. And we have a, a, you know, a large part of the population that's financially illiterate. So it's a it's a huge huge challenge, and it really is going to change the tenor of what is possible, you know, for us in the future in terms of our wealth, our quality of life. You know, the Fed they, they have all of these crazy programs and all these things they do and make up to try to be opaque. Um, I think if they don't do something by July, I think it will be very hard for them to do anything. I think they will will sit tight probably in terms of the election. Um, just, you know, they may telegraph something a little bit, but I don't think that they, they want to be perceived to be political in either direction. So I do kind of agree with that. But I do think the balance sheet conversation is probably more important. And I would be paying attention to that because, you know, there will be if data continues to trend in what we're seeing here, it does give them uh, enough cover to say, well, we're going to at least cut a little bit. And again, I mean, do you do you really think, Julia, that if they cut 25 basis points, 50 basis points, even 100, do you think that that's going to unleash the economy in some special way? Like, I don't really see that happening. So I think they have some room. You know, it's not like they're going from five and a quarter to two. You know, if you go from five and a quarter to, you know, four, seven, five, does that really change the dynamic of the economy other than just, you know, creating some optimism for the street. So, you know, I, I think they have a little bit more room than perhaps, you know, some other people do. I think that there's some data out there. So could they could they throw a little something out there? It's possible, but they just may really focus on that balance sheet mm -hmm. side. And again, both of the tools, you know, are, are doing the same things. You can be accommodative either way. So that just may be their backdoor way to get this done. That makes sense. Okay, so going back to the balance sheet, though, in the um, conversation around treasuries, can you frame up the argument one more time for us just to better understand it and why that is so important to pay attention to? Well, I think that, it, and again, this goes back to you know who is it that we, if we're if we're having two trillion dollar a year deficits, plus we have all of this short dated debt that is coming due over and over again and needs to be refinanced. You know, who is it that's standing by that is like able to suck up this data or this debt? So we know that it's not central banks on net that we have these, you know, countries that are are lightening their loads. Maybe there are some that are adding, but you know, when you net it all out, 
they are no longer the ones who are financing the U.S. government. So you certainly have some foreign buyers. You have the banks, which sometimes it's shoved down their throat to other primary dealers in the financial system. And then you have, you know, folks like you and me who, you know, I've certainly been, you know, laddering, you know, short duration <laughs> T-bills um, instead of, you know, with, with cash to just kind of see what's going on. But that sucks capital away from other things in the economy. So it's not like it, you know, something that you can do. And again, it doesn't have a consequence. I think that's the, the theme here is that, you know, whatever is done always has a consequence and you have to, to pay attention to that. So as this you know, continues on over long periods of time, it's pretty clear that the Fed is going to be the only one who is going to buy um, treasuries you know, at a rate that is appropriate. You know, when you have that supply and demand imbalance uh, in the treasury market and there's much more supply and not enough demand at a certain price, what happens you know, rates have to go up in order to entice that demand. Like we don't want to see in the bond market, you know, the the 10 year go to 8%. You know, that would be not palatable. So you would imagine that the Fed would step in and start buying it. And whether it's called, you know, we'll come pick a name, QE, yield c- control, Powell's new special, save the treasury program. I mean, they always make up these little programs and names, you know, to, to hide what it is that they're doing. I think that's the reality of it is that we got lots of debt that needs to be financed and so it needs to go somewhere. And the most likely scenario, given the lay of the land and the math, is that over time, near term, the Fed is going to have to be that buyer. And to do that, what do they have to do? They have to print money and that is inflationary. So a very sad tale, but you know, math is math. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Carol Roth. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.